Welcome everybody. I am Julie Moody Freeman, the director for the Center for Black Diaspora. If I think a number of you have been here before, if you um, if you have not, welcome. And for those of you who have been before, welcome again. Um, this is the Emerging Scholars and Creative series, and we created it um, because we intend to feature young Black intellectuals, film artists, filmmakers. They're up and coming. Um, and tonight we have Maya Sinclair. Anne Russo will be introducing, but just before Anne Russo um, introduces, I would like to acknowledge the co-presenters, um, the Women's Center with Anne Russo, uh, the Department of African and Black Diaspora Studies, and of course, the Center for Black Diaspora. I'd like to thank the center staff without I could never do this without them. So Joel Daly, the assistant director of the center, Catherine Douglas, the um, administrative assistant, Jennifer Ogumiki and Jessica Williams, who um, are the student workers. I'll turn you over now to Dr. Ann Russo, who is, in, who is the director of the Women's Center. Anne? Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Julie. And I want to uh, I want to thank you and the center and all the staff you just named for um, for co-organizing this and really for doing the bulk of the of the organizing and vision for this. So it's been a it's been a, 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 an amazing set of events and um, a beautiful a beautiful context for it this spring. And I want to um, also thank the people in the women's center who've been involved in helping to. Uh, publicize and get out the word. So I want to thank Belinda Andrade, Haley Curtis, Amalia Samaron, Nina Wilson, and Camilla Lawrence, who are all student workers in the Women's Center. Um, and I want to um, just welcome, welcome, welcome all of you to this event. And I want to welcome Maya. So welcome, Maya. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be able to welcome and introduce you. So um, I want to introduce Maya Sinclair. Maya Sinclair is a filmmaker, a scholar, a poet, a writer, an educator, and more. She is currently working on her master's in interdisciplinary studies with a focus on critical ethnic studies, women's and gender studies, and public policy here at DePaul. I've had the great honor to have um, Maya in my classes. She is someone who has brought Black feminist wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and love to my classes. She is an amazing community builder. And I think Julie really remarked on this just now, like the energy that Maya brings into a room. She is someone who listens, she attends, she leads, and she char charts out new ways of thinking and being in the world. This year, she will be the graduate student commencement speaker at Black graduation. So if you're going to Black graduation this year, you'll be able to hear more from Maya Sinclair. As a critical race scholar and filmmaker, Maya works to create and share the narratives of Black women. She began her film career in 2015 as a production coordinator and made her debut as a producer in 2019 at the Bronze Lens Festival in Atlanta with the critically acclaimed feature documentary that she's gonna be talking about this, this evening, Black Feminist. Um, Femme Noir is her first solo produced, shot and directed film that explores the idea of free Black womanhood. And she's currently working on a project uh, with a focus on Black mothers and daughters, which I'm very excited to, um, to be uh, involved in because it's part of her thesis work or her MA project. Outside of filmmaking, Maya hosts workshops, lectures, and events central to Black feminist theorizing and uh, organizing. So please help me welcome Maya Sinclair. Dr. Russo, like you know I will cry in a lick. <laughs> oh my God, that was the most beautiful thing anyone's ever said about me. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for this, for this opportunity. Thank you to the Center for Black Diaspora Studies. Thank you to the Women and Gender 
for, to the Women's Center. I just really am so honored, so humbled to be in this space with you guys. Um, and I'm so excited to um, talk us through this. I hope you guys enjoyed the movie. I watched it. Um, I watched it last week when I started the presentation. I watched it yesterday as I was finishing up some things. And I was just like, wow. This is real good. Like this is real good material. Um, it's easily buttoned up. It's not too much. It's not too deep. It's not too lengthy. It's just the right amount to get people to do their own research, to want to know more and to understand. So I'm so excited to talk about this with you guys and we're gonna go ahead and jump right in. Okay, false alarm. One second. <laughs> Let me make this um, bigger. And we'll do this this one. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <clears throat> Where's the thing? Apparently I have to share my screen first. All right, here we go. Okay, you guys can see my, everyone can see my screen? Yes, yes. we can. Yes, we can. Great, 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 great. Okay. I'm gonna just put that there. Okay, beautiful, here we are. And you guys can see the whole screen, right? It's not just like a like blocked out with all these screens right here, right? Yes, you can see the, whole, can screen? See the whole screen, yep. Beautiful, <laughs> perfect, perfect. All right, so Black Feminist, the doc, the theory, and the aesthetic. This is guided by me. So um, as, this is nowhere near as good as what Dr. Russo said, but I am a scholar, I'm a writer, and I'm a filmmaker. Um, and the, the entirety of my work and life efforts are rooted in capturing, creating, and correcting the narratives of Black women around the world. Um, so before we begin, let's set some values. Um, and I'll also explain why we're setting values. Um, Actually, no, I'm just gonna read what I wrote because it's right there. Um, okay, one second. I don't understand why this is, okay, just gonna minimize that. All right, so what are values and why are they needed? Values are ideals and agreements that, would, that we hold personally that we would like to be held by community. They are standards that we set so we have an agreed understanding across all hearts and minds. This is a circle, not a lecture. Yes, I am guiding this moment. Yes, this is a movie that I made, but ultimately this is a flow of thoughts. We are building and learning together. Um, my value that I bring, love. Love is always my value that I bring into the room. Love for self first, then love for others. Love must be the foundation that we work, learn and teach, build and create from. Um, so this would be a great opportunity to um, go ahead and head to the chat and just drop some values in there. I just want to know what everyone is thinking. And I'm going to open up the chat as well. Let me try to find the chat. I can't see the, does anybody else see the chat? Oh, there it is. Okay, hold on, let me double Yeah, there it is. I can see it now. My screen's like doing some weird stuff. But anywho, let's see what we got. Respect, accessible, 
I'm not sure what you mean, Raina, but yes, we should make this accessible to everyone. There is live captioning going on. Um, and so if anybody needs that, definitely feel free to utilize that. Grace, I absolutely love grace. Peace, freedom, yes, because we free up in here. Respect, respect, mutual respect, absolutely. Joy, 100%, because we love it. Um, compassion, absolutely being compassionate to one another. Inclusive, comfort, peace and kindness, absolutely. Family, honesty, strength, respect, joy, love, and honesty, absolutely. Those are so beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing those with us. We're gonna be utilizing the chat. I was gonna do some breakout rooms for us, um, but we're going to just utilize the chat and that's all right. So I'm gonna get out of that and then go back to presenting. Three, two, one, there we go. All right, so again, we're gonna go back to the chat. Quick question, what is your favorite thing a Black woman ever created? I love this question um, for multiple reasons. Um, as we all know, Black women are trendsetters. We are trailblazers. We are changers, agents of change, innovative. Um, we, we think of things and, and envision things in a completely different way. And so a lot of the things that are popular and trendy now, we all know that most of that comes from black women or at least at a minimum black culture. Um, so go ahead and drop in the chat again for me. Um, what is your most favorite thing a black woman ever created? Um, that can be artwork, famous dish, specific theory, uh, mine is intersectionality by the lovely Kimberly Crenshaw, um, song instrumental, favorite book, um, fashion, hair trend, film, TV show, organization, movement, and invention. I would love to see some inventions listed because Black women just, we just be creating stuff, okay? Some of the most useful things we've created. Okay, let's see what we got. Okay, we got hair products because yes, a lot of, a lot of the stuff that goes along with hair, like a Black woman was the first woman that ever created a hair weave. Um, those hot curlers, it was a black woman from Chicago. I think her, I believe her name is Marie Stewart or Marjorie Stewart. She created that. Absolutely hair products, braids, braids, dance, computers. Come on, C uh, Catherine, can you elaborate on the computer part? Can you unmute um, Catherine Douglas? Can you elaborate on that for me? Um, I realized that I might have gotten it confused with just women in general, but I am aware that women were kind of the first computers. Um, and if you look at in professions, people like Katherine Johnson, like being able to contribute to NASA, there was a larger contribution that is probably totally underrated and under-resourced. So I just threw computers out there. Yes, I mean, cause technology, I mean, cause yes. I just saw something on Facebook um, it was, it was like a black woman created like the first satellite or something like that had to do with our phones. I was just dumbfounded. I was like, wow, I had no clue that that's what we did. We, cause I'm a black woman. So that's me too. And that's y'all too. Music, poetry, neo soul. I mean, yeah. Come on, rock and roll. <laughs> Absolutely. Jazz, Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde. That's Bible. That's real Bible, Jessica, that's real Bible. Lemonade, cause yeah, of course we did. Cause we took those lemons and we made lemonade. Or are you talking about like Beyonce lemonade, Jada? You wanna elaborate on lemonade? You can unmute yourself. Jada, where'd you go? Okay, that's fine. Music, beloved, absolutely. Neo Soul, locks, yes. Ruby Fruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown. I feel like I need to go download that song now. Every book Toni Morrison has ever written. Yes, Mac and Cheese, because of course we did that right. We created it, we did it right. Pop culture in general, we set the standard that many still, absolutely. Under the Adala, that's a book. Okay, Black Feminist Thought, Bible. Okay, she meant Beyonce, right. 
Yes, this is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Ruby Fruit Jungle is a novel. Thank you, Raina. Thank you for the clarification. So um, the reason I bas the, basically the reason that I asked that um, is because I wanted to more so discuss a, an idea at large, right? The Black feminist aesthetic. Um, as it says right here, the Black feminist aesthetic is an idea or theory formed by Faluke Ogun Ogunleye, highlighted by Sidney Halliburton, that seeks to portray Black women in a positive and correct light. It has four main goals. So I was in Dr. Russo's course, I want to say maybe it was March of maybe 2020. Um, it was March of 2020. And she, Sydney Halliburton is also a fellow um, WGS graduate, right, Dr. Russo? Right. Um, she's a fellow um, WGS master's candidate graduate. And um, in her thesis, she talked about the Black feminist aesthetic. And that was the first time I ever heard anyone um, put words to, th to what I've always seen. Um, when I think about the Black feminist aesthetic, um, usually what comes to my mind is just the fact that when you watch things on TV, when you see movies, um, when you listen to songs, um, when you see Black women portrayed in a like positive, uplifting, relatable way, it's so easy for us to be like, mm, or at least me, let me speak for Maya. It's so easy for me to be like, yeah, black women did that. <clears throat> it's like second nature for me. Um, it's like looking at it and be like, yeah, yep, a black woman's hands was all over this. Um, I was just watching, I think the show is called First Wives Club. Uh, I think Jill Scott is the lead. Um, it's a remake of another of a, of a similar movie, but they turned it into a show. And I remember just watching it and seeing how these women were portrayed. Um, it's not like it left out the mess because life is full of mess, but it was portrayed in a way that showed that they cared for them, um, that they were nurtured, that the story was, um, that the story was true and authentic. And I was like, I bet a black woman made that. I went and looked it up. Certainly enough, the director, the entire writing staff were full of black women and women of color. And so that just furthermore speaks to um, the four main goals of the Black feminist aesthetic. Um, so Black feminist aesthetic restates and contextualizes historical facts. The Black feminist aesthetic provides a counter to racist and destructive images. Um, and then the Black feminist aesthetic also gives a platform for Black women to tell our stories. Um, <clears throat> And in a, in a time that we are in right now, and this is probably something that should have been um, more intentional throughout like all the, like ever since media's inception, um, but we know how black women have been portrayed. We know how they can be portrayed. Um, we know the terrible tropes like Jezebel, like Mammy, um, like Sapphire, you know, all those, um, tropes and, and stereotypes that they come up with for, with for us that um, portray us in such a negative light. And when you're creating from a Black feminist aesthetic, and that doesn't just have to be film, um, that's anything that you create um, as a Black woman and as a, and as a, a Black person who seeks to be um, in the fight for liberation for all, not someone looking and searching for power. Um, if you're a black person and you're creating, you should always be creating from this lens, right? Um, one that is affirming, one that is correcting, um, one that is nurturing um, and highlights us in the best possible way and not highlighting us in the best possible way that's like, um, like oh, they're perfect because ain't nobody perfect. But it's just, it's a difference in highlighting or showing someone in a way that is very derogatory to them and their entire group. And also being able to hold the problems with grace, like was mentioned earlier, with grace and dignity, um, and to still be able to move beyond them and, and show them in their full, whole, and human self. Um, did anybody want to have comments back to what I just talked about? Did that bring up any thoughts for anyone? I really don't want to sit here and lecture to myself or, you know, to, to, to y'all. I don't want to do that. I would love for this to be a conversation. So feel free to unmute yourself. 
If not, I can just continue on. Either one is fine. All right, I'll go on. Oh, there's some stuff in the chat. So sweet. Okay. This reminds me of discourse around pleasure politics. Chloe, would you like to elaborate real quick? Because I'm not sure what you mean, but I would love to know your take. Okay, hello? I thought I heard somebody, but if not, that's okay. All right, um, Chloe, feel free to elaborate in the chat if, um, if you, if you, you cannot unmute yourself. Okay, do you want me to try? I can quickly try to find you. Hello? Yes. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I'm an Acasis, uh professor, um, Woody Feeman, and we were talking about uh, pleasure politics um, the last week and just thinking about like uh, the aesthetically pleasing as it pertains to black women is something that's so important um, mm -hmm. from like presentation, whether it be with oh, like yeah. self maintenance um, to hair or just like a video that we enjoy and mm -hmm. um, recontextualizing and decontextualizing um, aesthetic materials in a critical way, but also in a way that um, brings us joy and um, helps to reframe um, uh, existence for black female bodies. So yeah, that's what I was referencing. Yes, also, if you haven't read Adrienne Marie Brown, um, Pleasure Politics, get in there. Cause she's really, really onto something. Um, and so, I feel like I'm managing so much. <laughs> with this um, chat. So this is the film poster for Black Feminist. Um, it's a documentary starting the racial and gender oppression of Black women in America. Um, that, this actual, this artwork we actually commis commissioned from um, one, of our, one of the artists named Imani. And I just love this. And I also have the shirt, I have it on my shirt. That's me. Yeah. Um, really quickly, can everyone just drop in the chat if you've seen the movie? So I just haven't, like, you could just literally say, yes, I have, I have, yes, yes, yes. Okay. 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 Okay, great, 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 great. Not yet, but we'll do, absolutely. Yes. Okay, I just kind of wanted to get a, a feel for the room, like, you know, who has watched this and who doesn't, because I realized that I only have, like, an hour. Um, so what I had prepared was real deep and we was just really in there. I was like, yeah, let me dial some of that back. So some, if you didn't watch the whole thing um, or some of it, you may not know what I'm referencing, but I will show some clips. So let's dive right in. Yes, how three black women made an internationally awarded film One Hot Summer in 2018. Um, so January 2018 to, did I not update the, oh no, that's right, yeah. So January 2018 to April 2018. Um, this is really funny because this project is also what pushed me into my master's program um, and really helped guide that I was in this program to do the work of liberating black women, um, capturing their stories um, and creating new ones that show us in a, um, in a beautiful light. And uh, me and my best friend were just like talking one day and she was just like, yeah, so I'm tired of people asking me why I'm a black feminist and trying to tell me that feminism is not for us and, and X, Y, Z, this, that, and the third. And she was like, yeah, so I'm gonna make a movie and you're gonna make this movie with me too. And I was like, oh, okay, great. Um, and so from January to April, also uh, in this little time frame, that's when I got accepted to DePaul. So in that time frame, um, we started, planning, um, figuring out what festivals we wanted to submit to, um, 
really working on a budget, figuring out who we wanted on our team, um, and just really trying to put together our vision for the film. Um, May 2018 through July 2018, we actually filmed. Um, and what's funny is when we when we did this initially, we were like, oh my God, after well, after we finished, we were like, oh my gosh, we just made a feature length documentary in two months. Yeah, we some bad man pajamas. And then like two weeks ago, we made a feature length documentary in four days. Four days and mind blown. Um, but yeah, so that was great. Um, we had doctors, we had lawyers, we had teachers, we had preachers, um, we had women in advertising, we had women in film. Um, we had so many women and we also had men. Um, we wanted to make it a point to make sure that when people watched this film, they didn't think we were being biased, right? They didn't think this was just us spewing our opinion of, of what we think and, and what we hear and stuff. We wanted to make sure that we included black men. If we're going to critique them, we also have to include their voice. Um, and so we also had black men, but they were not problematic. <laughs> we weren't gonna do that. And then lastly, August, 2018 to so the premiere in August, 2019 was post-production. Um, we were submitting to festivals. Um, and then when we got selected into Bronze Lens, um, that's actually when we premiered the film. Bronze Lens, just a little fun fact, Bronze Lens is the one, it's one of the few Academy qualifying film festivals. Before you can even submit to the Academy, you have to get into this level of film festival. And Bronze Lens is based in Atlanta um, and it is for black people by black people. And so, yeah, that's how three black women made an internationally award film festival in one hot summer in 2018, because it was hot. We also filmed at the Bridgeport Art Center. Um, and I want to say this because just a little demystifying about film. It is not the hardest thing in the world to do. Um, it does not take thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to make a movie, let alone make a beautiful movie, let alone make a beautiful movie that is impactful. You do not have to go broke trying to make that. Um, you just need determination and a crew with a good camera. Um, I definitely, we filmed at Bridgeport Art Center. We were able to, we guerrilla shot this. Um, we didn't actually have permits from um, from the Chicago Film Office, but it was okay because my um, my best friend, she was on the talent roster for um, the talent agency. So that's how that went. Um, so yeah, we gorilla shot this and it was hot. There was no air in Bridgeport Art Center. So yeah, we made a movie, it was hot and sweaty. It's great. Okay, any comments, thoughts, feedback? Anything anybody want to say about making films or any questions about making films? If not, we can move on. Okay. So this is getting into the film. Um, so Black Feminism. This movement was started out of and in response to the Black Liberation Movement. I'm and the sorry, I had a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, about the film, like how did you choose the participants? Was it randomly chosen? Was it like, how did you make those decisions about who to interview? Mm -hmm. um, um, was it just whoever who was available or was it sort of really like carefully chosen around sort of um, because you're looking for particular, res you know, responses? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, nothing that me and Zayna do as a film duo is happenstance. Um, we don't leave anything up to chance or accident or anything like that. We're super intentional um, because when you're making a film, if you're not intentional, it's super easy for things to get away from you. Um, so let's see, um, Tammy Winfrey Harris, she is a phenomenal, phenomenal writer. Um, I met her when I was in undergrad at Roosevelt. Um, she wrote The Sisters Are All Right. She actually has a book out now called Dear Black Girl, How to Step Into Your Power. Um, I met her that day, we connected. 
Um, it was great. It was great talking to her. And I was just like, yeah, she, she about it. She's about Black women. So we picked her. Um, my my OBGYN is Dr. Perpetua Goodall. Um, she did my surgery and literally saved my life. And when we wanted to talk about Black women and the disparities within health, there was nobody else I could, you know, could think of. Um, so that's how we chose her. Um, a couple other people, we, um, Jack, Miss Jackie, she's, um, she's light-skinned and she's got long locks in the film, Miss Jackie. Um, she was in another film that me and Zaino worked on. She's a nutritionist um, and, and she believes in holistic approach. Um, and she talks, she really, really is big on how black women can um, survive getting cancer. So we wanted to talk to her. Um, Kim, oh, Carrie Morris is actually a graduate of the Critical Ethnic Studies master's program. She also might be a professor, I think. Um, so we, so I knew her. She's a soror. She's a Delta um, from when I used to go to NIU. So I connected with her. Um, uh, Greg, he is a sexual assault prevention teacher, um, as well as he works with young boys to teach them about puberty and how to, you know, live as a respectful man. Um, and how to respect women. Um, so is Brian, he's a humanist. Um, he's just not for it, he's old school, but he's just not for the disrespect of black women. Um, Dr. Bishop, uh, Dr. Dr. Bishop, Bishop Galena, um, she is a black woman, one of the few black female bishops. Um, so yeah, very, very intentional about who we wanted to pick because we wanted to be able to cover or at least try to cover the spectrum that Black women are. Um, black women are in advertising, Black women are in te teachers, Black women are in movies, um, Black women are in medicine, Black women are holistic healers. Um, we really wanted to shape the movie and shape the film um, around trying to make sure that all voices were heard, everyone felt represented within the spectrum of all that Black women are. Um, there's a big question you. in the chat. What was yes. the most powerful moment in the filmmaking process that you continue to implement in your life today to motivate your work? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Um, give me a moment, let me think. I'll tell you a funny one and then I'll tell you like the real deal. So the funny one um, is we were making a film um, and it's just a, it's a bunch of black women around and this, and this older gentleman, he's this older black guy walks by and he's like, oh, what are you guys doing? And we're like, oh, we're, we're making a movie. He was like, oh, what are you making a movie about, about black women? And he was like, oh, he said something really like misogynistic and all but everything in my body wanted to raise up and just like, just drag him for everything he was worth. Um, but instead we just continued to make our movie and it is internationally awarded. Actually in February, we got an award. It was awarded for like best documentary in Nigeria. So yeah, mind your business, sir. Um, and so I just, that's one thing that I do take with me, just disregarding the negative, disregarding the naysayers, um, disregarding um, the haters, disregarding um, not, not affirming things um, and just pressing forward and just believing in your vision, believing in my vision to know that what I'm trying to do, what I wanna do, um, it's worth being done. And then um, the most powerful thing I'll say is actually while, not while the cameras were rolling, it was actually way more impactful what was happening when the cameras weren't rolling. Um, when we were all just talking and sharing thoughts about what whatever person just spoke, um, building connections with our talent. Um, some of those relationships I still have today, some of them I still talk to to, to this day, um, for specifically the people that I did not know. Um, and so building connections while on film, while on film sets was extremely powerful for me. Um, and it just, it's just something that I carry with me, uh, building connections and building bridges um, and, and being impeccable with who you are when you meet people the first time.
Any other questions? If not, we can move on. Those are great questions. And any other questions, definitely drop them in the chat. If they're not addressed, like while I'm speaking, um, he, I will grab, grab them at the end. That man is the reason that these stories need to be told and shared. Cause period, that's literally the point I was making. Literally the point. It's <laughs> you th is the reason why we're making this film. Don't you love it when that happens? Okay, so black feminism, um, this movement was started out of and in response to the black liberation movement and the women's movement. Um, that's kind of self-explanatory, but I can elaborate just a little more. Um, black women were tired. We were tired of being used as bodies, being used as, what was the hardest part about making black women? The heat? <laughs> um, but no, um, we were really tired of being used as bodies, being used as fillers in other people's movement, right? Being in the Black Liberation Movement um, and being there and not really receiving the, not really receiving the, um, the recognition or the appreciation that we deserved in that movement, um, being treated as if we're second to men, um, we're only there to cook meals um, and open our house for them, but we're not suited to help, you know, lead or help create things. Um, and then in the in, in the white feminist movement, we're just used as bodies. They want us to be women too and not voice our opinions, voice our concerns, um, show how disgruntled we are with being black. They just want us to focus on women. And as long as we're focusing on women and not bringing race into the picture, everything was okay. But as we know, it's not okay. Anytime you have to choose who you are or choose who you're going to be or feel like you have to choose because you really can't choose, um, that's when the problems arise. And then number two, the purpose of Black feminism was to develop a theory which could effectively address the way race, gender, and class were interconnected to stop racist, sexist, classist oppression. Um, and so yeah, like black feminism as a theory um, is everything to me. I always bring up the Kambahi River Collective Statement. Um, it full on um, solidifies and talks about exactly what black feminism is how it was started, why it was started, how it was no longer enough just to sit around and complain about woe is me, life is taught, you know, life is sad and let's have tea and crumpets. Like, no, they were like, no, we have to do much more than that. Um, we have to create, we have to write our story. We have to write ourselves out of this. And so um, that's truly, I don't really know where I would be if it wasn't for those black women who back then who realized like it was enough and we have to do more for us. Um, any comments, thoughts about black feminism? Um, you, can, you can also share like what it means to you or how you interpret black feminism. If you drop it in the chat, I'll take a second and read it. Um, other than that, we can continue to move on. Okay. The river, the librarian of black women. Reminds me of the feminism movement established to address the importance and empowerment of motherhood. Absolutely. Okay. So um, just thinking about how, as black women, um, we have literally two intersecting um, identities that we experience oppression through every single day, day in and day out. Um, do you ever feel like you have to choose between your identities, whether that be you being black and disabled, black and LGBTQIA, or black, disabled, LGBTQIA and poor, or being a black woman or being a woman who is Muslim or being a black woman who is Muslim and disabled, do you ever feel like you have to choose? I would love to see responses about that in the chat. M. Charles, I often struggle with if I consider myself a feminist or a womanist. I wonder, can I be both? 
Oh, I love that. And Charles, stay with that thought because a little bit later on, we're actually going to talk about womanism and feminism. Naya Kale, you say yes in some spaces. Would you like to elaborate? You can unmute yourself if you want. Okay, that's fine. Um, I don't think they can. Okay. Who was that? And we'll try to find. Okay, hold on. We'll try to find and ask to unmute. Okay. Just a minute, Nikel, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Yes, same. And I'm with non POC color and non black people and non LGBT. Okay, yeah. So are you saying that when you switch groups, you kind of fold into one identity or you lean into one identity more than another? Um, or are you just saying like, when you go into those spaces with them, they f you or you feel like you have to choose to lean into it. Is it like more like a choice for you, or do you feel like someone is forcing you into that? Okay, more of a choice, and that's okay too. Um, I feel like it's okay when it's a choice. Um, but when people try to force you or, or make you pick, I think that's when it becomes a problem. And then we all know code, we, well, code switching um, is, a, is a thing. It's a survival tactic at times. Um, and it can literally save your life depending on what the scenario is. Um, and so that's okay, but that's a choice. You know, it's, sometimes it's choice. And for, I can also just quickly define what code switching is. Code switching is like making the decision to um, talk a different way or act a different way or um, speak a different way, walk a different way, dress a different way, doing something different that is not necessarily true to how you want to be. Um, examples of code switching is like, I mean, if you work in a corporate job, you know what code switching is. You can't be like, yeah, what up? You know, getting back with people, you know, talk, you know, using Ebonics or, or AAVE. Um, I do because I'm, I'm past that part of my life. Like I'm Maya and, and you gonna get all of Maya at any given point. Um, and if you're not at that point, that's absolutely okay. Um, but yeah, you know, going from, yeah, you know, what's up, da 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 da, -da or saying like, hello, hi, I'm Maya, you know, that kind of stuff. Or when you are around your non POC friends, you don't listen to rap music. And then when you get around your POC black friends, you just, you know, you listen to all your black music or, or whatever. Um, sometimes it's, like I said, sometimes it's a survival technique. Sometimes it's just what you want to do because you feel more comfortable. Oh, we got something else in the chat. As an immigrant and refugee, I often struggle with my identity. In America, I am considered too foreign by the people around me in, in America, but in my home country, I am too Americanized. That's tough. Um, thank you for sharing. Absolutely. Thank you to everyone who has shared. Also, feel free to let me know if you don't want what you shared to be like read aloud. Let me know that too. Um, I code switch often with my Zimbabwean family and US family. Okay. Sometimes felt that during school being the daughter of immigrant parents. Okay, so you guys are connecting over that. That is beautiful. Um, any other thoughts anybody want to share? Thank you all so much for sharing and engaging with me. I'm just me, all me, all the time. Take me as I am or don't, cause period. <laughs> Janice, you be coming through with the periods, okay? <laughs> I felt that in my chest, <laughs> period. Okay, so we not new to this, we are true to this. Um, let me go pull this clip up really quickly for us. Give me one second, I'm pulling this up now. Where 
was just sad. I don't know, it's not, it won't let me track it the way I was earlier. I swear I tested all of this out. But thank you for grace and extending me grace as we move through this. Oh my goodness, it's 6.53. All right, this is over soon. So if you did not watch it, that's okay. Um, just go ahead and, you know, watch it. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful moment. Um, but I also, all right, so, Instead of me showing the clips, I'll just kind of talk you through the clip that I'm discussing and we'll go from there. Um, so I think one of the biggest issues I face is when, is you, when usually men, but sometimes women, say that women's rights and issues, specifically black women's issues, were a new thought. We have been fighting for our rights since the beginning of time. At every groundbreaking moment in history, you can find moments where women were saying us too. Um, this was the clip from um, Noel El Sadiwi's clip um, when she was talking about how the women's movement has been all around the world. Women have always been advocating for our rights. This is not something new that black women just thought up in the last 30 years and were like, yeah, I think I want rights too. That's not how that went. Um, always, all the time, we're always advocating for ourselves. We always understand and know that we are not second-class citizens um, and we are not going to move as if we are either. Um, and if you have any thoughts and comments to, to say to that, that's, you know, you can drop those in the chat as always. So um, I love this quote from Aisha K. Faines. She said, you've either got to be Nat Turner or Ike Turner. You can't be both. Um, for me, this is self-explanatory, but what does that mean to you? Um, I can also elaborate a little bit more. Is Nat, okay, Nat Turner, you know, he led the slave revolt. Ike Turner, like physically, emotionally, and verbally abused his woman. Um, and both of them were black men. Um, and you would think that both of them are for the, the, the elevation of our people, um, but you can't beat on black women. You can't disrespect black women. You can't degrade black women. You can't use black women. You can't murder, rape, and, and violate black women. Trigger warning, I'm sorry if rape is triggering, um, but you can't do terribly vile, harmful things to black women and then say you are for liberation and say that you wanna lead us out of here, that you want equality for all. It doesn't work like that. You cannot, uh, you cannot oppress the women in your group, but say you want liberation for all. That's really, you just want black male supremacy. Yes, black women have been the mules of the world carrying everything on our backs 100% and I think we are tired. We care, we literally carry everything, especially, truth is definitely true. Um, we absolutely 100% carry America's morality on our backs 100%. They always expect us as black women to do the right thing, do the good thing, um, do the hard thing, um, to save America from swirling into this abysmal, like depth of in, in, like immorality and in, in, inhumanity. Um, like the biggest example for me, that's always going to be this election that just happened. If black women did not vote, we would be in a completely different um, presidential situation. Um, and everybody was like, oh, thank you, black women. Thank you, black women. Thank you, black women. Thank you, black women. No, don't thank us. Just you do it. Why can't you do it? You get out and vote. You talk to your counterparts. Don't thank me. I don't want your thanks. I don't want your praise. I definitely don't want your honor. You do it. Do it so I don't have to for once. But yes. Okay, so here we go with the black feminism and womanism. 
Um, so personally, I identify as a Black feminist because that's who work, whose work, effort, and ideologies have loved and healed me to, into who I am now. Um, when I look at this discussion, I think of two things. Um, as Alice Walker said, womanism is to feminism as lavender is to, I, is, is to lilac. Um, the definition of womanism, yes, our Black women in Georgia did come through, um, but the definition of womanism is a Black feminist who? So Alice Walker herself literally aligns herself with the Black feminist movement. A lot of times this discussion, and I was just having this with my ship, um, for my ship nay, ship means sorority sister. Um, my ship nay, uh, she was asking me like, why would I wanna be a black feminist when I could just be a womanist? When womanism was created with black men, women in mind and black women had to create that for ourselves. Um, and it always goes back to, for me, the works of these women. It goes back to the Audre Lorde, to the Patricia Hill Collins, um, to the Octavia Butlers, to the Bell Hooks, um, to all these women who have done the, the literal foundational work, um, Tony K. Bambara, like those women who've done this work, um, who really defined what Black feminism is. It's those women's words, it's those women's works that have saved me and healed me into being the woman that I am. So I'm not, while it's nothing wrong with womanism, and if that is how you identify, that is fine that is okay but for me i'm not going to disassociate myself with black feminism when that's the women who like literally save my life um and also just, if you identify as a womanist that is okay um as the second part of my what i wrote says i see no need to differentiate between the two um because as long as both of us are on the path to liberation for all black people then i'm not really concerned with how you choose to identify yourself um if we if we are both concerned about the the well-being the welfare the souls the hearts and minds of black women then that's fine if we are both concerned about our lgbtq folks the black people in that community then fine if we are concerned with disabled black people then that's fine if we are concerned with all all of the religious spectrums that are within the black community and their peace and their well-being that's fine as long as we are collectively working together to get to the end goal which is the liberation for all of us then if you want to be a womanist that's fine if you want to be a black feminist that's fine if you don't even want to identify with the word but you are doing the work that's fine there's some stuff going on in chat. and again as bell hooks has written in her research black women founded the organization that pressured the Reagan administration, I believe, to pressure them into acknowledging the fact that mothers who care for their children should still earn money for the work that they are doing at home, because period. Yes, our Black women in Georgia came through. Yes, they did. And yet again, that experience and initiative in that entirely was overpowered by white women and men. And this is still a fight that's being addressed in contemporary history. Yes, Fatima, come through with the extra facts. Yes. Um, anybody want to comment on the black feminism, womanism discussion thing that just went on there? You can either ask someone to unmute you or you can jump in the chat. We'll just keep moving for sake of time. All right, so intersect hold for sound. Um, okay, so intersectionality and how Kimberly Crenshaw saved our lives. Intersectionality is crucial to efforts towards liberation because without it, we are just continually perpetuating cycles of power or looking for medals from the oppression Olympics. Our efforts must be inclusive and honor differences unless we become like our oppressors. Um, and then also thinking about equity. Equity does the work of lifting the people who are most vulnerable to a place where they can feel safe to move through life as they are. It works to recalibrate based on necessity and not what everyone else has. Um, I'm always a very, 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 very big advocate for equity over equality. I don't really care about being equal. I wanna have exactly what I need. 
because what I realized is what um, the Latinx community needs is not what Black people need. What disabled people need is not what able people need. Um, it's, it's not about trying to just give everybody everything because we're all starting from different points, all have different advantages and disadvantages. Everyone has different oppressions. Everyone has different um, privileges. So giving, every, giving everything to everyone equally does not help. Um, I'm always and forever on the side of equity. Please give me what I need that is unique to me and, and specifically will help me in a way that might not help someone else or what you give someone else might not help me. If I'm looking for water, please don't give me liquor. It's not about the label, it's about the go. Nike, are you laughing at me? Cause I said, if I'm thirsty for water, please don't give me liquor. Cause I really mean that though. And that's what like equality, oh my God, equality for all. That's not, that's not the move. Um, any thoughts on intersectionality and equity, equality? If you have them, just drop them in there, I'll come back. Oh, this is fun. I love this. What is the craziest thing a man ever said to you? Oh, <laughs> um, she said that's, that's what happened to her today. Somebody gave her some liquor and she wanted water, I guess. Um, but what's the craziest thing a man ever said to you? Please drop this in the chat. Please, 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 please. Drop that in the chat. Um, and then also in the film, I realized that um, one of the things that I said in terms of um, if you don't have ovaries, if you don't have X and X chromosomes, um, if you don't have a uterus, you can't tell me anything about my period. Um, Cause what I said was um, that women shouldn't have period. Um, and I understand that that can cause harm. And so I just wanted to put this down here because it's three years later and I realized how harmful that could have been. Um, so I just want to say, this is a conversation with hoteps of the world like Yada and Umar Johnson types that say to black just set women that something that our body does naturally and divinely is unclean or a disorder. This was not in an attempt to erase the spectrum of folks who have periods. I'm only saying that if your body doesn't experience having a period, you shouldn't speak on it and incorrectly at that. That that's my little that's my little moment of um craziest thing. Yeah. Yada really really goes on on YouTube and literally tells black women and black men that us having periods is unclean and, and it's a disorder and it's because we don't eat right and don't drink enough alkaline water. Like, sir, sir, go all the way to hell. Black women, okay, so somebody said, black women are the bottom, bottom mixed and Latina women are in the middle and white girls are top tier. Child, what? Cat. That says so much about the male gaze. They see women in tears of consumption, right? One guy at my job the other day was talking to my male coworker about how women's brains are smaller and we don't know how to work as well. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm gripping this table. Y'all can't see me, but I'm really gripping this table. I'm so sorry because it's sick things like that that white people used to use on black people to try to justify their sick treatment of us. You say, oh, they're not really human. They don't experience pain the same. They don't process things the same. They, their, their cognition isn't the same. Women have smaller brains, my God. Um, yeah, that's sick, Clarice, I'm sorry. Feminism is a white woman's movement made to destroy black men and black women, not only hoteps, but followers of Elijah Muhammad. Oh, she getting in there. Come on, Jessica. Yes, I'm actually, I have some comments about uh, black men in terms of uh, feminist movement. Okay, a sister has never done a thing to help a black, oh no, pause, I'm sorry. A sister has never done a thing to help a black man said to me as I was walking from the bakery while I was getting my black father a cinnamon roll. Oh my God, oh my God, my edges, I can't. I once saw a man whose dating profile said, I don't respect women. Hey, at least he honest, run clean away. 
having a man compare menstruating to having a man compare menstruating with having a bowel movement. Okay. My male coworker told me that I was very beautiful and said, and you said, I know, and later told me he didn't like my attitude because you telling me beautiful, I'm beautiful is not a compliment. I know that I have eyes. I can see my face every single day. By men that includes trans men. Um, yes, mm -hmm. sure, absolutely. A male, not a man, period. And my family said that my mother allowed me to play in the sun too much because I was getting too dark. He's dark skinned and so is my mom. Gee, self hate be real. Don't tell nobody that this summer, by the way. Your friendly reminder as things get hot. Don't tell black kids that they get too dark. Anybody else want to share anything? That's crazy. I just want to offer some love and some comfort to all of you who have experienced that being said to you. That's absolutely terrible. Um, and I'm just sending you love and comfort right now and care because that's wild. And you should not have ever had to experience anything like that. You inspired me to stand up for myself more. So I told my mom she was a... Y'all are really flooring me right now. I want to dive into a pool of African women. He probably stank, didn't he? Make sure not to stay in the sun. My own father and mother read him up and down. Cause period, cause we love moms who stick up for us. As I walked into a restaurant, a man came out and asked me if I was one of those mixed breeds. Not only did he ask you if you're a black had been, not diluted, but if you're, if you're, if you wasn't just straight black, as if you had to be so beautiful, you had to have something else added. Then he also referred to you as if you were an animal. The only thing man, by men I mean cis men, ever say to me is that I'm crazy. And that goes back to the whole like hysteria. His, the word hysteria is like rooted in like Latin or something. And it's like a, a feminine word and it's attached to women. And hysteria became like a, a literal term like in the early, Jesus, my history is leaving me, but like in the early like times of civilization, um, when women couldn't really speak up for themselves, own property, vote, anything that would make you feel like your own individual person, like even have bank accounts, they came up with the term hysteria. Um, so they could like lock their women away. Yeah. Yeah, that's depressing enough. Thank you all so much. Um, an irrational or white cis man. I mean, are we surprised though? But thank you so much for sharing again. Like I said, I send lots of love and care um, and, and grace to all of you who have experienced that. I'm sure that won't be the last time and I know it wasn't the first. So just sending lots of love to you guys for that. Oh, I was gonna show my clip of when I defined a hotep, um, but we can just move past that. So here we go. This is, we're almost at the end actually. And we have seven, 10. Okay, yeah. So it'll be like some time for like talks and questions and stuff. Um, to say that black women are borrowing the rhetoric of white women when we talk about feminism is to say that black women are stupid. Like it literally, did, like that, that was my best friend's quote. Um, her name is Zaina. I keep talking about my best friend. Her name is Zaina Thyra. She's like literally amazing. Um, but that's literally, depriving us of our humanity and our intellect and our um, ability to analyze the things around us and say, oh, this is probably not right. Um, oh, this is, this is not okay. This hurts me. I don't like this. Um, and to say that we have to follow behind white women in order to understand when things are not right. That's just ludicrous. Like that's literally ludicrous. Um, also saying that this is another thing I really hate. Um, also saying that black feminism isn't for black men negates just how much um, black feminism works to liberate black men from unrealistic and unattainable images that patriarchy has them striving to be in addition to depriving them of the range of emotions that we feel as, that we as humans feel. Um, for me, I really, I really, really, really detest when black men say things like, um, black women are destroying the black community. 
black um black feminism is um is causing the liberation it's it's holding us back um black women's issues um and black women's rights are are not good for the community any of that kind of rhetoric is is literally disgusting to me um because like as i said it doesn't it fails to realize that as black women and women of color um, we are trying to liberate our, our counterparts from white male patriarchy um, and, this, and this unrealistic, unattainable idea of what men should be. Um, you know, that's like overly masculine, um, overly sexualized, um, always in pursuit, greedy, angry, um, emotionless. These, it's like, I feel like patriarchy tries to turn men into like aggressive, angry pieces of meat. Um, and that's so unattainable. And it really, ne it, ne it negates the fact that as women, as we are trying to liberate ourselves from patriarchy, as we are removing that weight, as we are pulling off that veil for ourselves, we're also pulling it off for them. So then they no longer have to aspire and attain to try to be this, um, this figment of white men's imagination that they can't even reach themselves. Patriarchy hurts white men too, and they don't even understand that. And then also black men fail to realize that they have, they have the potential to be our biggest allies in the fight for our liberation. They have access to us in a way that most don't. They could hear our stories, believe us, and then defend us instead of attempting to convince us that we are delusional. Um, while I was filming my other movie, two weeks ago, um, I shared a post about men telling women to smile um, and how annoying that is. And this guy, John, who came on, he came on my post and was like, man, just, just walk away, you know, ignore him. And I'm like, can you please stop trying to tell me what to do in response to men and go tell men what to stop doing? Go tell y'all to stop doing things and stop treating us ways, stop hurting and harming us, stop. Tell them to stop. Don't tell me to stop paying attention. Tell them to stop doing what they're doing. And I, instead, in that moment, I really just wish he would have listened to me, acknowledged what I was saying, and um, and in turn, just listen to me. Just, just listen and believe what I say the first time. Don't try to convince me that it has nothing to do to me, do with me. Um, and I just, I feel like that's something that needs to be applied across the board. Just as black people as a group, we want white people to believe us when we tell them that they're racist or that they're hurting us or that whatever they're doing is, is affecting us in a negative way. We want them to believe it. So just like we, you want the white, white people to believe you, us as black women, we want you to believe us. Any thoughts, comments, anything? I, I've kind of gone in a little bit, so I don't believe in allyship. I get what we need. Nikel, we should be friends because I also too did not believe in allyship. And it wasn't until I took um, Dr. Russo's class on transformative justice did my mind change. Um, and But you also have to know the difference between a real ally and someone who's just calling themselves an ally. I don't believe in people who call themselves an ally. Like that's already, you're already caping too hard. You're already trying too hard. Um, so you really got to show up and do the work. So if there's people who are fighting with you in the fight for liberation, standing foot, foot next to foot, 10 toes down, holding your hand, um, as you're moving towards liberation, those are your people. Those are your allies. Those are the people that you believe. I have some friends, some really good non-Black friends that I really trust. And that's because they've shown me that they are what they say they are, that they care about me. They care about my people. And until somebody shows you that, then you don't have to believe them. But when they do believe them. Um, so allyship is possible. But I feel you, Nike. I absolutely 100% feel you. Okay, so this was also um, when the and it, this was in the movie when the when the black guy was talking about as black men how they need to stand up and protect us, stand up and defend us, stand up and listen to us and support us. Um, so this was really my take on that. Don't we? Don't we wish all black men would hear this and agree? And it is not so much to agree, but it comes down to being willing to learn and listen. It's not continually 
being committed to misunderstanding and staying ignorant because it is more comfortable. And this is also, I, I'm just going to read it. I believe the true reason why most seemingly reasonable Black men choose to ignore us when we bring them our issues with them, it is because it will cause them to have to reassess the way they live their lives. It will force them to be accountable for the harm that they may have caused in their personal tribes and communities. Um, and that bottom line is really important for me, and it was a... Um, uh, uh, an idea that I kind of had last night because I'm like, there's, the, you know, there's the people that are, you know, vehemently like, no, what you say is wrong. I do not agree. Um, that is terrible. That's not right. Whatever. Just completely ignorant and belligerent to who you are and your politics. Um, and then there's the other people who um, don't want to agree with you or don't want to acknowledge the harm that has been done to you or that it is being done to you because it will cause them to reassess. Um, I'm really, really thinking about rape culture specifically. Um, there's men who are like, nah, that one rape, she shouldn't have wore this, she shouldn't have wore that, da 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 da, or no, I didn't coerce her into having sex or whatever. It's the guys who think that they're good guys think that they don't do these kind of things and find them and start looking back over their past. And they're like, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I did hurt her. Maybe I did, maybe I did do that. And so instead of going through accountability and realizing the harm that they've caused, taking accountability and atoning for it, they just want to flat out deny that it's even, even a thing in existence. Um, and just across the board, um, that's just a, a, an anomaly that I've been seeing, but it would be so nice if Black men for a change would be quiet, open their ears, listen to understand and not respond, and then make changes. Um, I think, anybody have any comments, questions, concerns? That's the end, that's literally the end of my presentation. Some Black men don't understand that trying to push us down on the food chain doesn't, ooh, come on great some black men don't understand that trying to push us down on the food chain doesn't move them up in the eyes of others my goodness Whew. that was good the nice guy is just another face of toxic masculinity oh for sure because he's not really the guy he's only a good guy till he gets you alone and then he wants to try to like coerce you yeah i am realizing that i am more radical feminist okay be that that is amazing. I love that for you. Um, but yes, <laughs> that's basically it. Overall, I just feel like Black feminism is so needed. It's so necessary um, in terms of theory and the way we analyze and recontextualize the world's issues um, in the way that we create whatever we're creating, especially if we're talking about marginalized groups creating from a black feminist aesthetic is so necessary and it's important um, and it's in a way to uplift and 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 honor those communities in all of their spectrum of good and bad because i'm sure there's good and bad in everything um, but creating through the lens of black fem like through the black feminist aesthetic is so important and so necessary and is and it is easily a way forward into a better way um, and so, yeah, no, I love, I love us. I love black women. I love black people. I love women of color. Um, I love people of color. I love us and all that we bring, all that we are and all that we try to be in this world. Um, yeah, I, 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 I also extend so much love and care and grace to all of you. Um, thank you so much for being, um, going through this ride with me. I really hope you all enjoyed the movie. I hope you guys enjoyed what I had to say. Hope I didn't sound like a crazy person um, or, you know, ramble and babble on. Um, I, I hope this was really um, great for everyone who attended. Um, and so if you guys have questions and things, this would be a great time to drop them in the chat and I'll go ahead and answer them amazing content thank you no thank you thank you for coming i'm glad you enjoyed it this was great
Thanks, Maya. That was wonderful. Thank you. And I enjoyed your film also. Thank you. So before, um, as your um, as you stop sharing, could you um, put your website um, link in the chat and also how we can reach you, whether we can reach you on Twitter, Instagram? Yes, it's actually on the screen right there. Ah, you see, <laughs> right it's there. literally on the screen. Right well, hold there. on. Thank you. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so my website, mayasinclair.com. I'm on Instagram at maya underscore Sinclair. Um, on Facebook, you really get a real dose of who I am. If you want to add me on Facebook, that's fine too. That's Maya Sinclair Parker. It's under my married name. Um, but yes, that's me. Thank you, Catherine, for dropping that in there. That's me. Do we have any final questions before we close out? I just wanted to ask, um, for those who may not have seen the film, did you want to share that link with others too? If you, yes. I don't know if you, when you dropped it in earlier, if you did it where everyone could see it or just the folks in the room, there it is. Okay, okay good. And, and um, Ms. Joelle, um, you can actually, when you send out the recording, you can drop, you can throw the link in there too. Okay, I can do, okay, I'll definitely do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, y'all, don't forget to go cancel those um, Quelly's, Quelly subscriptions. <laughs> don't right, forget. I have to do that tonight. <laughs> oh, do it tonight. Also, Quelly is a great platform with amazing Black content. It's run by a Black woman. Quelly has great content. So if you did end up with your $5.99 membership, go take advantage of it for at least those 30 days after you cancel so you can get that good content, okay? <laughs> Thanks for reminding us about that. Yes. Um, while we are finishing up, Joelle, would you like to share the event for next week? And um, also, there's a survey link that was dropped in the chat. If you could take a minute or two to let us know how we did, we'd really appreciate that. Um, before Joelle shares the event, again, I want to thank Maya and thanks to everybody who showed up. Maya, I definitely want to show this film again, particularly because I teach Black feminist theory in a U.S. context. And I just, I, I loved, um, you know, you talked in this about sort of the community feeling. You don't feel like there is some sort of hierarchy. Everybody's mm -hmm. presented, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get these mm -hmm. different definitions. So this is yeah. like a perfect a perfect um thing uh film for for not only for everybody to view because it reminded me so much of bell hooks's feminism is for everybody because it right? is yes that's what it, it was is. reminding me of yep but it's perfect for classes also so thanks a bunch all right Absolutely. so Joelle, Thank you. i leave the floor open for you okay yes i was just gonna go ahead and share about this event that's coming up um, it's called Our Muses, Art and the Family Archive. That's gonna be on June 3rd. Um, and so the, I think the link has been dropped in the chat. And it's essentially a program with three artists. One's African-American, one um, is Mexican-American. And the other one is a painter um, who does this wonderful work. And the idea was to look at the way um, artists use their family members as subjects for inspiration. Um, like a lot of their work, their paintings, their photography is really centered around their family members. And so the event bite has been dropped in the chat. It's going to be, uh, I'm just showing you my screen so you can kind of see who the artists are, uh, Juan Molina Hernandez, um, Ellen Holtzblatt, who's a wonderful, wonderful painter, and also Kaylin Nail Roach, who is a photographer out of Baltimore, who does a lot of work around okay. his family. And so check it, you know, come back on June 3rd to check out, to participate in this event. Uh, it's really about how, you know, artists use their family members in their artwork. 
and you know as a way to sort of keep a family archive but also to sort of communicate their relationship to these to these family members and there it is thank you all right well good evening everybody take care